In today's homework lesson, we will be looking at the southern region of the 13 colonies. We will be answering the four guiding questions we have asked for each of our region lessons, but this time about the southern colonies. One, how did climate, geographic features, and other available resources distinct distinguish the three regions from each other. Two, how did people use the natural resources of their region to earn a living? Three, what are the benefits of specialization and trade? And four, how did political and social life evolve in each of the three regions? So let's get started. Title your notes, Southern Region, and list the five colonies that are included in the Colonial South. Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. These colonies are colored pink on the Maryland. King Charles I granted the land south of the 40th parallel to the Potomac River, which is now Maryland, to George Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore. The Maryland colony was named after Queen Henrietta Maria, wife of Charles I. The first Lord Baltimore died before settling the colony, so his son, Cecilius Calvert, the second Lord Baltimore, organized the expedition of colonists. Two small ships, the Ark and the Dove, set sail in 1633. They carried about 140 people and all of their supplies on a four-month voyage across the Atlantic. The Ark returned to England, but the Dove remained in Maryland, and you can go see it today. There's a replica there at St. Mary's where the first Maryland colonists settled. Even though the Calverts established Maryland in order to make money, they also established the colony so that they could make a living without discrimination because of their Catholic faith. In England, the king's religion is called the Church of England, and Catholics like Lord Baltimore had been denied rights for failing to be loyal to the king's religion. Lord Baltimore wanted to make Maryland a safe place for Catholics and made sure that their rights were protected. Of the first 140 settlers who left England in search of wealth, different opportunities, and a better life, only 17 were actually Catholic. The rest were Protestant indentured servants. What is an indentured servant, you may ask? Great question. An indentured servant was typically a poor man or woman who signed a contract and worked for a master for a set period of time, usually four to six years, in exchange for transportation to the colony, food, clothing, shelter, and often to learn a trade. At the end of their period of indenture, they might receive land, money, or tools and supplies to start their own farms. Many people came to Maryland as indentured servants. Maryland offered poor people the opportunity to come to the New World and eventually gain land and wealth. By the late 1600s, economic conditions in England improved, and fewer people came to Maryland as indentured servants. By the 1690s, plant planters found that they could earn more money if they did not have to pay laborers. So planters turned to slave labor as tobacco production increased. So did slavery. You already know how Virginia was settled, with Jamestown in 1607. The early colony is known for the House of Burgesses and the success of tobacco growing on the many plantations in the area. More and more settlers arrive from England and begin spreading out further and further around Jamestown. Then other settler settlements begin emerging, emerging further north, south, west of the original Jamestown. Jamestown was the original capital of Virginia Colony in the beginning, but was burned down during the events of Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. So they relocated to a place called Middle Plantation. The members of the House of Burgesses discovered that the temporary location was both safer and more pleasant of an environment than Jamestown, which was humid and plagued with mosquitoes. A school of higher education had long been an aspiration of the colonists. The colonists in Virginia commissioned Reverend James Blair, who spent several years in England lobbying and finally obtained a royal charter for the desired new school. It was to be named the College of William and Mary in honor of the king and queen of the time. The college still exists today. About the time that Jamestown got rebuilt, the college students made a presentation to the House of Burgesses, and it was agreed in 1699 that the colonial capital should be permanently moved to Middle Plantation. A village was laid out, and Middle Plantation was renamed Williamsburg in honor of 
King William III of England, befitting the town's new elevated status. You already know much of the story of the settlement of North Carolina, which was first settled in 1587. 121 settlers land on present-day Roanoke Island. It was the first English settlement in the New World, but it was not permanent. You know how it goes. By 1590, all of the colonists on the island had disappeared, and today it is referred to as the Lost Colony. So the first permanent English settlement in North Carolina occurred in 1655, when this guy, Nathaniel Batts, a Virginia farmer, migrated to an area just south of Virginia with the hopes of finding suitable farmland. In 1663, King Charles II awarded eight noblemen called the Lord Proprietors, the province of Carolina, named after the king, in appreciation of their efforts in helping him regain the throne of England. At the time, the province of Carolina included both present-day North and South Carolina. Draw a picture of the king granting the land to all of his lord proprietors. In 1665, Sir John Yeamans established a second permanent colony in North Carolina on the Cape Fear River near present-day Wilmington. In 1670, a settlement near present-day Charleston, South Carolina, was established. This settlement grew quickly because it had a natural harbor and allowed easy access to trade with the West Indies. Charlestown soon became the principal seat of government for the entire region because of the distance between Charlestown and the points in the northern part of the colony, the terms of North Carolina and South Carolina came into use. In 1729, the Lord Proprietors sold their interests in the Carolinas back to the English crown, and North and South Carolina became separate royal colonies. You already know this, but South Carolina and North Carolina was one big colony in the beginning. And you know the story. King Charles II gave the land to those eight noblemen known as the Lord Proprietors. North and South Carolina became separate royal colonies in 1729. In 1670, the first permanent English settlement in South Carolina was established at Albemarle Point. Many of the original settlers came from the Caribbean island of Barbados, including the new governor, William Sale. In 1680, the colony moved to Charleston, later known as the capital of South Carolina. It was a cultural and economic center in the southern colonies. Because of the influence of the Caribbean settlers, the colony's original eco economy resembled the plantation colonies of the West Indies. It would become a major center for rice and tobacco and indigo production. Indigo is a type of blue or purple dye. The colony's plantation owners were among the wealthiest people in all the colonies. By the late 1700s, African-American slaves represented the majority of the population in South Carolina as the number of cotton plantations increased. Draw a picture of the slaves working on a cotton plantation. The colony of Georgia, located directly in between the English colony of South Carolina and the Spanish colony of Florida, was the subject of frequent military invasions by both sides until the Yamasee War left the area with very few people. In 1732, James Oglethorpe received a royal charter for the province of Georgia. It was named after King George II. Oglethorpe imagined the area, of, the area of Georgia as a refuge for England's poor people who were crowded together in debtors' prisons. You see, if you were in debt back then, they would put you in prison. Oglethorpe's friend had died in prison, and he thought it was wrong that the poor were being persecuted like that. He believed the debtors would become, could become farmers and possibly soldiers to defend the colony from the Spanish in Florida. Draw a picture of these poor people getting out of debtors' prison to head to Georgia for a new chance at life. In 1733, 116 settlers arrived in modern-day Savannah aboard the HMS Anne. Yeah, the HMS Anne. Georgia would become the last of the English colonies in the New World. 
Soon immigrants throughout the world came to Georgia in the hopes of being awarded generous land grants. And Georgia quickly became a major center for the export of rice, indigo, beef, and pork. The southern colonies have a similar geography and climate. These colonies all border the Atlantic Ocean on their east coasts. The coastal plain provides flat, flat land that the settlers used to farm plants and develop their large plantations. The climate in the southern region has mild winters but hot, humid summers, which we know about because we live here in Virginia. The climate was ideal for growing certain crops that could be produced on these massive farms. The five southern colonies all produced similar natural resources that became cash crops for the region. Cotton, rice, indigo, which is made of, into a purple dye, and tobacco. And these crops required a lot of land to be grown on. The more land, the more crops could be grown, and the more money plantation owners could make when these crops were sold at market. Also, these products required lots of manual human work out in the fields, planting, tending, and harvesting. Thus, the need for slave labor and indentured servants was crucial for the landowners to make money on these crops. There were some free farmers who managed smaller farms that grew enough for their families and a little extra. Plantation owners who owned miles and miles of land were the wealthiest because of the amount of crops they produced. The African-American slaves that were forced to work against their will and the indentured servants who hitched a ride on board ships that came from England and if they worked for free for someone for a certain number of years, they had their freedom. Southern social and political life was definitely different from the other two colonial regions because most people lived very, very far apart, growing crops on their large expanses of land. Neighbors sometimes lived several hours horseback ride apart from each other. Because of this, plantations actually acted like mini towns themselves, producing things that they needed right there on the farm. Oftentimes, large plantation owners would devote some of their slave population to skilled work like blacksmiths, coopers, etc., in addition to the slaves out working in the fields. Plantation owners would host parties and social functions at one another's homes in the South so that all of the neighbors around would come for the day or for a few days to enjoy one another's company. The slaves and indentured servants also had community with one another and lived in separate quarters than the land owners and their families. Their communities were brimming with culture, including music and religious events. Few cities existed in the South. Those that did were mostly on the coast for shipping the crops produced on the plantations to load up on ships for trading. Also, there were very few schools. Poor farmers either taught their children at home or did not teach them at all because the kids were busy helping their parents on the farms most of the day. A few local schools did exist, and often these were only open to students between planting and harvesting times. Sometimes, traveling teachers would visit these schools to teach for a few months before riding on to the next school. Slave children were not permitted to learn to read or write. Wealthy landowners' children were educated by private tutors who would come and teach within the home because these rich families could afford it. <laughs> 